Agency's Growing Diplomacy Initiative, which is my signature program as Vice Provost for Global Affairs. After 34 years as an American Foreign Service Officer and American diplomat, and having led Carolina's global efforts for several years now, I can see that UNC has all the makings of a top tier producer of the next generation of global leaders. The Diplomacy Initiative seeks to build on Carolina's existing standout strengths to better prepare Carolina students to excel at tackling tomorrow's challenges. I'm so grateful to have Ambassador Jovanovich. I'm grateful for her for traveling here from Washington, D.C. to share her experience and insights. As a three-time American ambassador, she has tackled more than her fair share of global challenges. We can count on her tonight to offer a nuanced and deeply knowledgeable perspective on the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. For all the students who have streamed into this auditorium repeatedly this spring for Ukraine-focused events organized by Professor Robertson and others, I know your interest in this topic is deep. Ambassador Jovanovich had a global education not unlike many students here at Carolina. As an undergraduate at Princeton, she was inspired to study Russian, in part due to a personal connection to the language through her father, who hailed from Russia. She then studied abroad in Moscow, where her interest in language in the language only strengthened. One of the very finest diplomats of her generation, Marie Ivanovich, is currently a non-resident fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. During her 33-year diplomatic career, she served as U.S. Ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, and Ukraine. She also worked in Russia, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Somalia, and she held multiple assignments in Washington, including important leadership roles like Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the European Bureau. Ambassador Jovanovich is the author of the recently released New York Times bestselling memoir, Lessons from the Edge. It is a great read. For any of you considering a career in the Foreign Service, this is a must read book. Lessons from the Edge gives a realistic view of the Foreign Service. Both the challenges and the rewards, both are great. And it does so with a winning combination of grace, humility, and readability. It offers readers a glimpse of the strength of character an American ambassador needs to lead effectively and with integrity. And for PWAD students, I want to do a special shout out to the chapter on Kyrgyzstan. Ambassador Jovanovich describes the impact of securing rights to a military base on the larger US agenda, how the base overshadowed work on human rights and good governance and efforts to shrink the space for corruption. And of course, for all of us grappling with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this memoir from America's last ambassador to Ukraine offers invaluable background on how we got to the current situation. And we can ask her tonight about the way forward. Ambassador Jovanovich will offer some opening remarks, and then take questions for the great bulk of the period. Students who are participating in tomorrow's policy brief competition have submitted some questions in advance, and we will uh, ask those questions first. And then we'll turn to you, our in-person and on online live stream audience. So put your thinking caps on and start working on some good questions now. Ambassador Jovanovich, we are delighted to welcome you to Carolina. And I'll hand things over to you now to get us started. Thank you so much. And Barbara, thank you for that really, really generous uh, introduction. Um, some of you know that my parents retired here in the area, and so it's, it's, it's great to be back uh, in North Carolina and um, seeing some old friends and many, many new friends as, as, as well. So I um, promised Barbara I wouldn't um, talk for too long um, because I'm really interested in talking about what you want to um, talk about, uh, and so going to questions and answers uh, pretty quickly. Um, but I did want to offer uh, just a, a few introductory comments. 
um, about uh, the book that I wrote. And um, so I think as many of you know, 2019 was a really challenging year for me. And in fact, it was the, <laughs> the worst year of my life, both professionally and personally as well. And I really didn't know what I was gonna do afterwards. It was clear to me that um, my career in the foreign service uh, was over. And so I, I knew I would be resigning, but what was I going to do next? And the answer came from all over America. I got a lot of letters uh, from people, hundreds, if not thousands, um, who, you know, thanked me for my service, which is, you know, you can never say that often enough, um, and um, said that they were interested in hearing more, that um, they wanted to hear more about the Foreign Service, more about my life, the challenges, the opportunities, uh, et cetera. And so, you know, as I was thinking, I thought, well, maybe I should write uh, a book. And so I wrote a memoir uh, called Lessons from the Edge, uh, which is about my life and the um, you know, various places that I've served and the challenges um, that, that I faced. Uh, and um, I'm hoping that through those stories, uh, people will learn more about the Foreign Service, about the State Department, and about why diplomacy is so important to every American. Because I think often the connection between what uh, people in Washington do or people at an embassy overseas do and our lives here in the United States, I think that's sometimes a really tenuous connection because um, Ukraine, just to pick a country in the news, is so far, far away. Why does it really matter what's, um, you know, what's happening there? Why does it matter to, to me in, in my life? So I tried to address uh, some of those questions and we can talk more about that um, in the question and answer period. I also wanted to talk about um, democracy. Uh, much of my career was spent in the former Soviet Union and many of the countries that uh, I, in fact, all of the countries that I served in, including Russia, those, um, the leaders of those countries came to the United States and said, we want you to help us um, transition out of communism. We want to um, build a democracy. We want to um, have a market economy. I'm not saying that they knew what those terms meant because these were communist party leaders. Uh, and I don't think they understood you know, what it would take to make that transition. Uh, but the U.S. was all in on, on helping these countries and helping, you know, many of the people in, in those countries on that for two reasons. One, we thought it, was, it would be good for those countries because democracy is obviously, um, you know, not a perfect system. In fact, I think it's been said that democracy is the worst system in the world, except for all the others. Uh, but here's what I can tell you. Democracy has... Um, has you know, made more people in the world safer, more prosperous, and more free than any other system. So we thought that um, helping those countries uh, make that transition would be good for those countries. And we also thought it would be good for us. And that's, at the end of the day, why we are stationed abroad, um, working on various issues, because it's what is in U.S. interest. And we believe that it was in U.S. interest to help countries uh, transition to democracy because democracies make better partners for the United States. They are more reliable. They, are, they share our values. They are more prosperous. They make much better partners across, across the board in, in, various, um, in various ways. And there's, there's also a, a linkage between um, our democracy here at home and our, um, our leadership abroad. Because uh, you, know, you can even ask uh, many generals in the US military, uh, what is the most important asset that the United States has? Why, why do people follow the US lead even today? And the answer is our values. That is what um, makes the United States the United States um, over time and, and certainly today. And um, you know, back uh, during the Cold War, George Kennan wrote uh, a very famous uh, telegram back to the United States about um, how do we contain communism? And one of the things he said um, was that, um, that 
the strength of our democracy and the strength of our economy is what will uh, determine whether our policies towards the rest of the world, the free world, but also the communist world led by the Soviet Union will prevail. And I think that is still true today. Um, so I think that the connection between uh, the health of our democracy at home and the strength of our diplomacy abroad is uh, really pretty critical. I also um, talk a lot about the importance of integrity. I think it's important at in a university system, it's important on the individual, you know, every individual needs to act with integrity and our nation needs to act with integrity. Um, and so, you know, we can perhaps talk more about that later. There's a lot uh, of um, different themes, including the importance of having women in the foreign service. <laughs> and I can see another foreign service officer who happens to be a woman agreeing with me on that. And what, uh, what my experience back in the day was like um, and um, so, and then of course, I also talk a lot about Russia and um, because I served in Russia in the early 1990s, but since I spent much of my career in the former Soviet Union, Russia was the big kid on the block. And so whatever what was happening in Russia was important to understanding what was happening in the countries that I was serving in. And um, that was a, a real education and made me realize uh, that um, we, while we wanted to embrace uh, Russia and the family of nations, um, that Russia still continued to pose a threat in the um, early 2000s and in the teens, and certainly today. China may be the bigger, more capable, uh, more powerful country out there, and maybe the more long-term threat for the United States, um, but Russia, even as a waning power, can do a lot of damage on the way down. And I think we're seeing that today in Ukraine. So on that really uh, pessimistic note, <laughs> I will stop and hopefully I'll come up with something more optimistic. <laughs> Grant, we're gonna go to you to yeah, off here. And put your mic on. <laughs> I, think, I think it's on, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so thank, thank you so much for those remarks. We're really excited to have you here today. Thank you. Um, and I know a lot of our students uh, and, and other people in the audience uh, are sort of looking up to you as a, as, 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 as a role model in lots of ways and your career and uh, the, the, the dignity which, with which you've uh, served. And so it just got me thinking about uh, some early experiences, um, uh, early things that you learned that sort of shaped you and, and, and set you up for a career in the, in the Foreign Service. And so I was wondering if you could share one or two things from either from, from home or from, from, from school or from, or, or from college I really you think that were important lessons that you learned that that were you know really helpful to you in in, in your career as you as you went forward yeah so um my parents uh, grew up in europe during world war ii uh, and so they witnessed and experienced many terrible things um escaping you know the communists in russia and then the nazis and so that is not um, my lived experience, but it is certainly my learned experience because you know how everything that your parents went through, you go through too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, um, when they found uh, uh, a home in the United States, they were so grateful. They were so grateful that they lived in a democracy um, because they knew what it meant to live in an autocracy where you cannot say what you think where you cannot worship as you please, where every part of your life is controlled. And they just appreciated their freedom in the United States so much. And they appreciated the freedom of opportunity where they could bring up my brother and I, and we could be you know, anything we wanted to be. And they taught us that uh, we were really fortunate um, to be living in the United States and um, eventually I, I became an American citizen and to be an American by choice. We were so lucky. And so because we were lucky, uh, we had to give back. My parents were both teachers and um, they um, you know, taught generations of students, not only the lessons of the classroom, but the lessons of life. And those students are still you know, in touch with my brother and me because that, those were such formative experiences for them. And so when I, um, you know, went to uh, college and then ultimately um, uh, selected a profession, 
I mean, I thought back to, you know, well, what do I want to do? And so what I wanted to do was something that I was really interested in and was excited by. And that turned out to be diplomacy, although there were a lot of, you know, side, <laughs> side adventures, you know, before I found my path. Um, but it also married up that desire to um, serve the American people who had given us a home. Um, so I think that the concept of, of service is a really critical one. And because all of us need to give back uh, to the United States, because anybody sitting in this room, if you are lucky enough to you know, be a part of the UNC system, you are privileged. And I, I would just say, I'm sure you all are giving back or will give back. It's, that's that's uh, you know, a, a really important lesson. The, the, the other thing that you mentioned during your remarks <clears throat> that, that really caught my ear was you talked a little bit or you alluded a little bit your experiences as a woman in yeah. the foreign service. So I'd love to hear more about that <laughs> uh, and, and how that experience hopefully evolved and changed over, over the time in your service. Well, um, so when I uh, joined the foreign service, there weren't that many uh, female models. And so in fact, when I went to uh, London as a very junior officer, my three male role model, my three role models were all men. And so, you know, one of the ways that I tried to imitate them was to wear boxy little suits with, you know, the little tie that women wore back in the day. Um, but what, what I found most interesting was uh, with these three different men, they were, it was the first ambassador who was the ambassador under President Ronald Reagan, uh, then the charge, who was a professional diplomat, and then um, the second um, political appointee who was um, President Bush's um, appointee as the um, ambassador to the court of St. James. They were all different, but they all, um, you know, really fully inhabited the role and were very successful. And that kind of taught me that I needed to be my own person, mm -hmm. that I didn't have to be a little man in order to succeed. I could be myself. It took me a while to be comfortable in that, um, but I thought that that was a really important lesson. So there just weren't that many um, women, uh, you know, kind of ahead of me. And um, I, you know, there were the obvious amazing exceptions like Madeleine Albright, uh, but she was not, not, not career. And then a, a couple of other people that certainly mentored me along the way, um, but there weren't that many examples. And um, so we were talking about this earlier today. It's hard to describe what it was like because if you experience that feeling of not really belonging, and you know, sometimes it's called imposter syndrome, where you know, should you be sitting at the table or not? Do you really deserve um, to be um, to be in this meeting? Should you raise your hand when um, when uh, you know what the answer to it is to a particular problem, um, but everybody else is kind of not meeting your eye? Um, just that sense of that there's no place for you in this room. And it's really hard. You know, there are the obvious examples of sexism or harassment of, you know, being chased around a table or something like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how does one, um, you know, become fully present and deserving um, of uh, participating in, in my case, in diplomacy. But I think um, this is true in other professions, perhaps as well. And so, one of the one of the kind of funny but not so funny anecdotes that I put in um, in in the book after much um, you know consultation with friends as to whether this was too gross or not. Um, but the State Department was um, you know kind of a male bastion for for decades and decades and decades. Um, and then at some point the interlopers came in and um, the bathrooms were never renovated. So uh, in, in the um, many of the uh, women's uh, the ladies rooms at the State Department, we have urinals. I mean, to this day, <laughs> to this day. So, I mean, what kind of a message does that send to you? <laughs> And so my male colleagues who have read the book are like, you know, they sort of had that same reaction, of course. And they're like, we didn't know, we didn't know. And I'm like, of course you didn't know because you weren't, you know, using those facilities. You, you, you didn't know that. But to me, it's kind of um, an example of, um, you know, if you're not a woman in the room back in the 1980s, 1970s, um, you wouldn't know that feeling uh, of, 
kind of being excluded, even though, though you were kind of there, it's still really hard for me to express actually how, um, how difficult it was. I think fast forward to, to today, we've made a lot of progress in terms of, you know, senior people at the top, um, you know, far more gender balance everywhere. But I think one of the, the biggest challenges for women in the State Department is one that is probably very familiar to every, every woman in this room, which is, you know, who's taking care of the kids? Who's, who's you know, keeping all the household activities going? All of that still falls mostly on women, not, not completely, and we've made a lot of progress, but the State Department, the Foreign Service reflects American society. And so, um, you know, that remains a challenge, especially if you are moving every couple of years. You know, can you imagine moving your household every couple of years, resettling the kids in school, the, um, you know, the adjustments that everybody has to make? And much of that falls um, on, you know, the wife, um, because that's, that's just reflective of our society. So how can we make uh, the Foreign Service um, more, how can we help that process so that, um, so that some of that burden is lifted? I mean, there's, there's a lot more that I could say about that. But the last thing I would say is we have made progress with uh, women at the top. So the Deputy Secretary of State, the number two, and the number three are both uh, women and very, very qualified, strong leaders. Um, but the reason why I don't think that that's a complete achievement is that we always remark upon that as, my goodness, well, we've got women at the top. Um, the day when we're not remarking on that, that's when we'll get, when we actually have arrived. Mm -hmm. Barbara? <laughs> There's some Foreign Service moms in the room who were just nodding vigorously through all of that. <laughs> and I, I think there's a military person in the room who was also nodding. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We've got um, some questions from students and I wanna go ahead and share um, one of them. Oh yeah, I'm gonna move on into mine, Graham, rather than going to the other. So the student questions come from a public policy course titled Global Policy Issues taught by Tricia Sullivan associate professor of the Department of Public Policy and the Curriculum in Peace, War, and Defense. So the students in the course are interested in hearing your thoughts on the longer term consequences of the US response. How do you think the United States response to this war will affect the United States reputation as an international leader? Well, I think we're already seeing some of that now. I think the Biden administration is doing a, a pretty good job of uniting uh, a Western, um, primarily European, but not only a Western response uh, to Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And, and that's not easy, especially given the damage that has been done to many of our alliances in the previous administration. The Biden administration came in with the set goal of repairing those relationships and was moving forward in that direction. And I think you can see the results that um, countries are coalescing um, behind um, behind the United States, and I think it's a pretty strong response. Which, um, but it's not over. I mean, uh, frankly, I think uh, this war is going to go on for some time, unfortunately. And so, will that uh, response, uh, will that unity um, continue, and for how long? Um, because I think uh, there is the issue of the challenge with regard to Ukraine. And obviously I feel very strongly about this. Uh, Ukraine must prevail, but there are two reasons why Ukraine must prevail. First of all, because it's the right thing to do. It's a democracy that was not threatening Russia and we cannot allow an autocrat to just grab a country and go. <laughs> but it also directly affects our national security because if Russia is successful in Ukraine, and I'm convinced it won't be, at least not over time, uh, if Russia is successful in Ukraine, Russia will keep on going. And um, not only will Russia be emboldened uh, that, oh, you know, um, I was able to take Crimea and now I was able to take all of Ukraine. Putin has told us, he told us this on the eve of the war, as well as previously, that he wants to bring um, other countries of the former Soviet Union back into the fold. I mean, I think we should believe him, given his track record 
of um, you know, Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014, Ukraine again in 2022, I think we should believe them. Uh, and if autocrats around the world are all of a sudden given license to um, make war on other countries for whatever purpose, you know, they, they, they want a, a piece of land, they want influence, whatever it might be, um, that makes for a less secure world everywhere, including in the United States. It makes trade harder. That will affect our businesses and it will affect our jobs here in the United States. And we will be less free. Um, so I think it's really, really critical that we get it right in Ukraine. And the jury is still out, unfortunately, because this is an ongoing challenge and it will be, um, it will be an ongoing challenge for some time. Graham, you've got some more questions. I have some more hard questions from uh, <laughs> Professor Sullivan's public policy class. Um, this is a really good one. Do you think Russia's invasion of Ukraine was preventable? Mm. Have Western countries' policies or actions encouraged Russian aggression? And could Russia have been deterred? Yeah. Well, so I think it's a good question, but I think we always need to remember that there is one aggressor here, and it is Putin, it is Russia. And um, even as we talk about, you know, what about our actions or the actions of Europe or the actions of Ukraine, it is never okay for a country to just invade another country and grab hunks of it. Um, and I would remind this American audience that um, there are some in Russia who um, have not given up on Alaska because, you know, used to be Russian. I mean, not a joke, <laughs> not a joke. So, um, so there's that. Um, the other thing, just as a kind of a framing um, uh, uh, issue, is that we in the United States, understandably, I think every country does this, but we look at events in the world as, you know, um, what did we do that it's all about us? You know, was it our fault? Did we actually um, make this wonderful thing happen here because it was all about us? And so, again, I'm not making fun of that. I think it's understandable that countries look at events through their own national prism. Um, but I think we also need to remember that countries other countries have agency. Russia you know, had many opportunities to do different things over time and under the leadership of President Putin chose not to. Um, and the Russian people also have agency. So are there things we could have done? Um, maybe, and I'll get to that in a minute, but. At the end of the day, this is about Russia. And the last thing before I actually answer your question <laughs> is um, I would also say that um, I can't imagine that if the United States had said, we're done with NATO in, in you know, 1991, the Soviet Union has been dissolved. And um, so we're done with NATO, we will close it down as an operation or different thought exercise, when Poland and other countries came knocking on NATO's door, uh, we said, no, 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 we're just gonna keep our little alliance here. We're not going to invite you in to be a part of a collective defensive pact uh, that is based on shared values. No, we're not gonna do that. So, you know, fast forward to today, I mean, imagining either of those scenarios, Putin who has told us that Ukraine um, does not is not a separate country, that it's a construct of the Soviet Union and some like delirium, um, that the Ukrainian people are um, not a distinct people and um, they are little Russians in fact. Um, so he's given us this whole construct of why um, he is invading Ukraine, protecting Russian speakers, protecting um, uh, those of Russian origin. Um, I mean, does anybody here believe that uh, he wouldn't have done that anyway. And I, I find it hard to believe that his evolution over time, I mean, he is still the same man he was, um, you know, in East Germany and in, in Petersburg and um, uh, in the early 2000s as um, the, the president who became an autocrat. I mean, I'm telling this to a Putin expert, so maybe you're going to disagree with me. But, um, but I, I, I just think that um, he has not changed that much over time. And I think we probably would have been here anyway. That said, you know, could we have handled NATO enlargement in a more delicate way? Maybe, um, although from my perspective, I mean, I, I, I was in uh, Russia for 
uh, from 1993 to 1996 at our embassy. And what I remember is the lion's share of the attention from our leaders, you know, whether it was Clinton or anybody, you know, the cabinet, et cetera, um, went to Russia, not to Ukraine or the other countries. The lion's share of our assistance um, monies went to Russia. We had a very close and collaborative um, partnership on all sorts of security issues, starting with nuclear, but, you know, it ran across the gamut. And, um, you know, we invited Russia to join the G8, even though Russia was not the eighth largest economy in the world. But we believe that if we brought Russia into the fold, uh, into the community of nations and included Russia, Russia would see um, the goodness that came from being part of the international system and that following the rules-based order benefited Russia. Um, we, you know, in, in 1998, we, uh, we created the, um, the NATO Russia Founding Act, which was the basis of our relationship with, uh, with NATO's relationship with Russia, that was unprecedented and re a really important step, and was actually quite constructive on a number of issues. I mean, there were even people, you know, at the in the late 1990s that were talking about an eventual um, Russian membership in NATO. I mean, that's hard to believe now, but we were actually, you know, some people were actually talking about that. So, from my perspective, we were actually trying um, to. To, to bring Russia in. And, um, you know, once Putin came to power, um, he, you know, focused on his domestic issues first in, in terms of uh, eliminating the opposition and, um, you know, making the oligarchs instead of independent business many. <laughs> um, he uh, ensured that they only were his um, money launderers and not with, with no independent political base neutralizing the free press, et cetera, et cetera. But then he turned to foreign policy as well with you know, the results that we see. So I think he was on this path, um, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm not sure to what extent we could have deterred it. So what is your opinion on whether the US or other countries should provide more direct military assistance to Ukraine? So does that mean boots on the ground? Is that what we're talking about? You know, the word is um, direct military assistance. So I think you probably want to explore whether we're talking boots on the ground or javelin missiles. Okay. <laughs> so um, as all of you know, we have provided um, billions and billions of dollars just in the last two months of security assistance to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, items uh, that were you know, items both in terms of the type of weapon system and the quantity that would have been inconceivable on February 23rd. You know, every week we blow past those barriers and we keep on going. And in my opinion, we need to keep on going because um, right now is when Ukraine needs those weapons. I mean, you all know that there's going to be the biggest tank battle, apparently, since World War II uh, in the Donbass, and it is going to be big, and it is going to be bloody, and so they need those systems now, and we need to keep on giving it to them, and I think that's what the um, Biden administration wants to do, and I, you know, they are continuing to reach out to allies and partners to, uh, for those countries to do their part, because the assistance needs to be there now. In two months, it's going to be too late. So in that, in that respect, I do think that um, we do need to do more and we need to keep on being creative about what does it take and how can we get it to them? Um, but so on the question of boots on the ground, I mean, it's clear that nobody wants the United States or NATO to be in a war with Russia. That is, is not, not a good scenario from any, any point of view. And I think the, um, the Biden administration is trying to um, navigate a very, very narrow lane, which is to support Ukraine as much as possible, um, try to deter um, or punish uh, Russia as much as possible, and to support the frontline states on NATO's eastern flank. Uh, and I think they're uh, doing a, a, a credible job on that. But but it is hard. I mean, there could be miscalculations. There could just be mistakes. An errant missile goes, um, you know, instead of to a Ukrainian target, goes uh, somewhere in NATO territory. How do we respond? Um, and I think that it's, um, it's, it's risky to keep on helping Ukraine, no question about it. But I think there is also great risk 
in not doing enough. There is risk, obviously, to Ukraine, but there is also risk to, uh, frankly, the free world, because the Ukrainians right now, they are fighting for their country, they are fighting for their families, they are fighting for their freedom, and they are fighting for our freedom too. And so we need to keep on helping them. We need to do as much as we can. You wanna do Navin's questions? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so there's a, actually a couple of questions from uh, both from uh, Navin Bapat's class um, and from Aaron, Aaron Whitaker's class too, which focus on the issue of corruption. Um, as we were talking earlier, uh, President Zelensky ran on an anti-corruption platform. So I guess there's two questions. One is, how would you assess the progress or lack thereof that they made before the war on fighting corruption? Um, and then what do you think the implications of the war will be for that battle against corruption in Ukraine? Yeah, so, um, you know, President Zelensky, as everybody probably in this room knows, was a comedian who um, played an accidental um, president on TV and then became the accidental president of Ukraine. Um, so it was a, a matter of uh, life imitating art. Uh, and the Ukrainian people really believed in him. They gave him 73% of the vote. Um, and he basically didn't campaign. He just went from city to city and did, you know, sort of comedy routines and stuff like that. And he had a two, kind of a two sentence platform, which was um, stamping out corruption, which is very popular in Ukraine. And secondly, bringing peace in the Donbass, also very popular. There was no detail as to how that would be accomplished. And I think that, you know, um, Zelensky was a neophyte in, in politics, uh, and uh, he discovered that it was harder to make progress in those two areas than he, um, he had imagined uh, initially. And um, so I think, I think he struggled um, in, in the first years of his presidency. I was there uh, in uh, late January, early February, right before the war, and he was not nearly as popular as he had been. I mean, he um, and uh, public opinion polls not, not doing well. And he, you know, every action, I mean, imagine this, I know as Americans, we can't ima imagine this, but every action seen through the lens of politics. Um, so, uh, and how it would affect his own um, personal uh, fortunes. So I, I think some progress was made on corruption uh, or anti-corruption, uh, but not nearly as much as people had hoped and certainly not as much as Zelensky himself had hoped. Um, and so fast forward to what does this look like after the war? I think, um, I, I think it will depend, first of all, how the war ends, right? Um, is it, um, you know, have the Ukrainians won? Or is it, um, have the Russians dominated militarily and there is some sort of guerrilla war and civil disobedience in Ukraine? Um, and I, you know, the Russians, um, we, we, so just to backtrack for a moment, we often talk about corruption in Ukraine, um, but other countries of the former Soviet Union, starting with Russia, are no less corrupt. This is a legacy of the communists and very hard to eradicate because it was kind of a way of life. I mean, corruption breeds um, and flourishes when systems don't work. And the communist system doesn't provide services to its people. And so, you know, I want a telephone hooked up in my house. You know, I better give somebody some money on the side all the way up to grand corruption. So we talk about corruption in Ukraine because the Ukrainian people put it on the agenda. They said um, in 2014 with the revolution of dignity, which means basically I want to be treated with dignity. I want to be treated according to the law. And I want you, the corrupt president, also to be treated um, with dignity and be beholden and accountable to the law. Um, that's what that revolution was about. And so they put um, fighting corruption on the agenda. We were all in on that. The administration, uh, the Ukrainian administration was all in as well, at least in the early years. And that's why, um, that's, that, that's why it, it is such a focus. And I, I sometimes feel that the Ukrainian people are unjustly punished for trying to actually get rid of corruption and um, you know, not making as much progress because the entrenched forces um, are pushing back, of course, because 
nobody wants their rice bowl broken. So they're gonna, they're gonna push back and progress uh, can be slow. So it's, uh, I'm trying to, so, so all of that is still there. I mean, right now we're watching, um, you know, a, a people united against a common enemy and people are helping each other, whether it is, you know, putting food on the table or, you know, helping with medical issues or helping people find a place to sleep, whether it's in a subway station or someplace else. Um, but um, the way people, you know, think about systems has not yet completely changed. And especially I think um, if there is, um, so, so I think we just need to see what that evolution looks like over time. Um, right now, I think that people are relatively honest, including um, people in government structures, because they have to be. They know that there will be no tolerance. For example, you know, if, if some general decided they wanted to make some money on the side and sell some stingers, I mean, the Ukrainian people would shoot that general dead. Um, there would be no tolerance for it. But what is going to happen later, I think, will depend on what happens in the war and how the Ukrainian people come together in peace. Because, you know, as hard as war is, and this war in Ukraine is terrible, um, but peace can often be an even harder problem to manage. We should probably go to the audience at this point, you think? I uh, want to ask the question about NATO. Let me ask that one and then we'll... The Navin Bapitz class, his students also asked about NATO and what does the future of Ukraine's relationship with NATO look like? Mm -hmm. It seems like the idea of joining NATO is at least for now off the table, yet there's some consideration of Finland and Sweden joining, which could exacerbate tensions with Russia. If NATO is willing to consider these states, why not Ukraine as well? Yeah, I think some in, some in Ukraine are also asking that question. Um, I think, with um, Sweden and Finland, these are not countries at war. There are defined borders. I mean, all of this sounds like techno speak from diplomats, but it actually does make a difference when you're talking about an alliance. And for now, it's not that the US or NATO has taken um, the issue of NATO membership off the table, although it was not under active consideration. I think everybody knows that, including, I might add, Vladimir Putin. Um, but Ukraine itself has taken, taken um, that issue off the table. And, you know, so if it was all about NATO and, you know, the ills that we have done to Russia with NATO enlargement and everything else, you would think that the Russians would have jumped at that concession that the Ukrainians made in their negotiations. And yet, no, because Russia is not yet ready to be serious about negotiations. The last question from the students, I want you just to go straight in and talk about it, Masha, is what does Putin's endgame look like? The students acknowledge that he seems to have backed off of taking Kyiv, but he's really going after establishing um, a land bridge to Crimea. And what can be done, if anything, to prevent this from happening? Yeah, so I actually don't necessarily agree. I think that if Putin, um, so I, I agree that, Put, that, that Putin, the Russians, they want the land bridge to Crimea. I think they'd like to go further east um, to Odessa um, and you know, basically block um, Ukraine from having any access to the Black Sea. Then it just becomes kind of a rump state with an, and is landlocked and again, dependent on Russia in really, really critical ways. So I, I agree that that is, that is an important objective uh, for Russia. But I think that if Russia is successful in the Donbass, um, just by pounding um, you know, civilians into submission, um, if it's successful with the land bridge, I believe that the Russians will keep on going. Um, that, um, that Putin has told us what he wants. He wants all of Ukraine. I think there are parts of Kyiv that are historically important and uh, important from a, a cultural and a religious point of view uh, for, for the Russians. And so I think they will certainly want Kyiv, um, but I think they are gonna keep on going uh, because um, that's what they want. That's why we have to stop them. We do have a question from Taylor Horn. Taylor, are you here? Taylor, would you start with the second question, your North Star question? Yeah, sure. Um, my first one was about um, his, corruption. yeah, about corruption, but you've pretty much answered that. So thank you. 
Um, my second question was, um, so we're both in a class with Aaron Whitaker about the ethics of national security. So my question was, how do you personally guide yourself to be ethical in your career? And what have you kept as your North Star to do so? So, you know, as I said in the very beginning, I was so fortunate that um, my, Pam, my family gave me a really strong base. Um, and, you know, uh, they, um, they tried to bring me up to do the right thing. And I didn't always agree, but, you know, somewhere it stuck. <laughs> and um, being ethical and following, uh, following the rules is it's, it's a muscle like any other. Um, you need to practice it every day uh, in life with the little things, because you know nobody starts out by saying, oh, I'm gonna steal a billion dollars from the Ukrainian people. Nobody starts out that way. You know, it's, it's a little, little bribe on the side. And you know, that didn't hurt anybody, nobody found out. You know, let's take a little bit more, let's take a little bit more. So I'm using the example of, 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 of bribery, but obviously there are other areas as well. If you, if you do, you know, and, and perhaps in our um, line of work, one, one of the examples is gifts. And this comes up every time a president, an American president leaves office, you know, where are the gifts? And, you know, did they accept gifts that were, you know, over the monetary limit and everything else? And, um, you know, sometimes you feel that it's kind of silly because, you know, really, I, I can't accept this gift that is over the limit of, and I think now it's like $24 or something. I mean, really, I can't be bribed for $24. You cannot bribe me for that amount of money. Um, but, um, but it's the, you know, it's, it's, it's about the appearance as much as anything else. And so when I, when, um, I was in Ukraine the second time, um, the, 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 the big business people, the oligarchs, they knew that American ambassadors wouldn't accept gifts. Um, and I think that makes an impression. Uh, and so, you know, I think these little rules are important to, you know, develop those muscles so that when you have the big temptation, it's a lot easier to say no. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think I think you really need to, to stick to the rules. My, um, I found that that kind of gave me guardrails that I could just fall back on. Oh, well, I can't do this because you know, of X, Y, and Z. And sometimes you're in situations that you can't really foresee, but then you make up your own rules. We've got a question also from Micah McKinn, a double major in Russian and Peace, War, and Defense and a Russian flagship program ambassador. Micah, are you here? Would you go ahead? Yes, so I'm also in Professor Whitaker's class. And my question is, what do you think speaking truth to power, um, a very popular turn of phrase I'm aware, um, looks like at different levels of organizations? Yeah, um, I, 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 think, I think it's important um, to share with uh, your bosses um, when you think that there's a problem. Um, but I think it's important uh, to share it in a way that uh, will get results. Um, because, um, you know, if you're nattering on and on and on about <laughs> something, um, it, it's probably not going to be um, as effective as if you um, present an issue and present possible solutions, for example. Um, and I think you know, in the State Department, we have this tradition called the dissent channel. And uh, we have a very um, boisterous, shall we say, um, policy debate about what our policy should be on various issues. Um, and, you know, anybody can sort of get their oar in and, and tell uh, people what they think and why they think some idea is not, not a good one, et cetera, et cetera. But once the policy is decided, we are expected to, you know, move forward and implement it. Um, and it may not be the policy that you think is the right one. So I think the first thing that people need to make a decision about is, is this something that you can live with? You know, is this, because, uh, you know, in diplomacy, uh, in defense, uh, in other areas, it's not like there are, um, 
well, maybe sometimes this happens, but it isn't usually, there's a right answer that is clearly the right answer, and there is a wrong answer, which is clearly the wrong answer. There's usually shades of gray in all of the policy options. And often by the time it gets to be a big issue, there's only, you know, like bad choices in front of you. <laughs> and so given that, um, is, is this something you can live with? Or is this something that um, you really can't implement? And so then in the State Department, there's this much beloved tradition of a dissent channel where you can write um, a dissenting opinion and send it in theory to the Secretary of State. In fact, it goes to the policy planning um, office, um, but somebody is supposed to read it and somebody is supposed to respond. And sometimes things, uh, you know, that, that dissent is taken into consideration. And then you need to decide whether, um, you know, whether you can live with this policy if, if it continues in that way and whether you um, can implement it or whether you should seek another assignment or whether you feel so strongly about this that you need to quit and write an op-ed in the New York Times and you know, make this your cause. I mean, there are many different ways that you can express you know, concerns and um, uh, you know, speak truth to power. I guess the one thing I would say is uh, it's important to try to do it in a constructive way that actually um, has an opportunity to um, produce results uh, as opposed to just being, you know, another person sounding off about, about something. Um, so I, I, I guess that would be uh, another thing I would think about. I would add that the Armenia chapter in the book is a wonderful reflection on how far you can, can go and can you live with it. It's really mm -hmm. well done. The only other thing I would like to say about this is that as foreign service officers, we spend time in training talking about what Ambassador Yovanovitch has just gone through is when is it time now to quit and go to the New York Times? You know, are there other steps you can take? So it's something that's under constant and active consideration, I think. Yeah, and it's going to be different for everybody. Yep. And I'll give you another example from my life. Um, I did not think that the second Iraq war uh, was a just war, and I didn't want to be any part of that. And um, I wasn't a Middle East expert. I wasn't being recruited to go to Iraq. I was able to, um, you know, just ensure that my assignments did not take me in that direction. And, you know, you could argue that, well, maybe I should have done something else. Um, but that was, um, that was my way of um, staying out of something that I didn't think the U.S. should be doing. Um, you could also argue that, you know, when your nation is at war, um, right or wrong, you have to be there for your nation. And, you know, people, different people, honorable people come down on these questions in different ways. And I think the important thing is to respect that. That was a great answer. I do think we should open the floor up to questions now. <laughs> so um, we're gonna take questions from both the live audience and the online audience. Yep, great. So audience, um, if you're in the online audience, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. And if you're present in the auditorium, please raise your hand. There we go, we've got a hand up already. This is wonderful to indicate you have a question and then our staff are moving around with mics. I think the mic is going up first and we'll come back down, please. Good evening, Ambassador. I just wanna say thank you for your service. Thanks. I'm a retired military myself and and we get that a lot, but I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for, for what you've done for our country. Um, I actually have two questions I want to ask. If you entertain both, I'll, I'll start with one and see if we want to move on from there. Um, you just mentioned the war in Iraq and your opposition to that. Do you think that, I know Putin's given some, uh, some justification as far as, you know, America's intervention in Iraq. Uh, do you think that that's legitimate, uh, just based on what you just said, like is, is what we did in Iraq and should we avoid doing that in the future to, to keep Putin from using an excuse? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, you know, this is a great thing about being retired. I no longer have to defend <laughs> our decision to go to war in Iraq. Um, and uh, here's what I would say on that. Um, I, I did think that uh, the Iraq war decision was, was incorrect and wrong. Um, but that doesn't make it right that Putin would, would invade Ukraine. Um, you know, I mean, two rights don't make a wrong. 
Um, and, you know, to answer your question, I think that, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, uh, you know, is the saying. And so another situation could come up for the United States and we need to, you know, look at, um, at you know, the country and, and all, of, all the ramifications, including the secondary and the tertiary um, possible repercussions. So, yeah, I mean, I think we, we always need to look carefully at what we do, um, particularly if we're gonna use the military instrument. Amy, there's a question down here too. One more. Okie doke. Um, so my question has to do with the um, future of the United States and Russia relationship going forward. Um, so when the U.S. has been at war with other countries, um, very often the, that relationship changes, like with Germany or with Japan, um, very quickly after the war. Um, could you see a similar um, reparation of the um, U.S.-Russia relationship um, after the outcome of this conflict is decided over the next 10, 15, or 20 years? So um, I, I think there's a difference, um, at least at this point in the war, um, in that with Germany and Japan, they were they lost the war. They were completely subjugated. Um, there was an occupation um, by the United States and in the case of Germany by the allies. Uh, we helped rewrite constitutions. Um, you know, there was, were educational programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we ran those countries for a period of time. Uh, we are not at war with Russia um, at this point, and I hope never. Um, so I, I think the, I think there's a real difference, uh, in, in the two circumstances. Um, but I do hope, um, that at some point in the future, we can work our way back to having a, um, if not a positive relationship with Russia, at least a constructive relationship with Russia. We managed to do that during the cold war. I mean, there were some very dangerous moments, but we also had certain mechanisms in place. <clears throat> we negotiated all sorts of treaties that kept, um, you know, the United States and the rest of the world and certainly the Soviet Union safer. Um, and so I think we uh, need to figure out how, how we can do that. But at this point, um, my understanding is that all of the uh, communications between our military are kind of on pause, except for a really important one, which is um, the hotline. And that gets tested every day so that if there is a, um, you know, a mistake is made or you know something bad happens um at least at the working level uh we can call the russians to find out you know what happened there with that missile that landed in poland um or whatever the question might be um but um I, we really um the relationship is pretty ruptured right now and it's going to take a lot of hard work uh, on our part on the russians part uh and um and probably with some allied assistance but the first thing that has to happen is Russia needs to stop its aggression against Ukraine. I mean, this is a violation of everything um, that, um, you know, kind of uh, the, the post-World War II order, and it is making the world much more dangerous and Russia has to stop. We have an online question or shall we go to yeah, the next question? Yeah, we're actually going to do online right here. Sami, got it? Not. There we go. So, um, we have a question from Stephen Prince. Um, what actions can the U.S. administration take to encourage those who have not taken a stand? So these are other countries, for example, India um, and the Middle East, um, for uh, or those that are helping Russia. Um, so, so what can we do? Um, what can the U.S. do to compel these these states to to take a greater stand? Yeah, and uh, and that's a, a really good question because there are a lot of questions. Uh, country, not a lot, but there are a number of countries that are standing on the sidelines wondering how this is all gonna turn out um, and not wanting to commit one way or the other until it's clearer because there, you know, there could be repercussions. Russia has a very long, long memory and, um, and we can see how ruthless uh, Russia can be. 
So I think that um, the issue of, you know, uh, what, what some kind of, you know, first of all, there's a diplomatic tool, you know, reaching out to countries and trying to find arguments for, um, for why they should stand up um, and be counted um, in what is uh, a pretty existential struggle, I think, not just for Ukraine, but for democracies around the world. Uh, and so I think there's a diplomatic tool um, different countries um, respond to different kinds of arguments, and that's where embassies come into play. People who have uh, who have um, area knowledge, specific regional knowledge, uh, can really help with shaping uh, shaping some of those arguments. And then there's also, you know, so that's kind of the carrot, right? Of uh, what what are the inducements out there to make you do, or to help you do the right thing? But there are also sticks, and and that could include sanctions because. Uh, Russia needs help uh, in avoiding um, the pain of sanctions, and that usually involves other countries as well. So using, uh, using that is also um, uh, a possibility. We have a question here. <clears throat> there we go, Chris. Hi, I'm Christopher Williams, uh, Peace, War, and Defense first year uh, major. Um, my question kind of deals with um, American Sorry, citizens. Could you raise and your hand because I'm not seeing you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there, oh, there you are. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so I guess it's, I feel safe to say that Americans overwhelmingly focus more on domestic policy than international relations and policy. I think for me, this was shown with the Trump administration, at least in my lifetime. Um, but how do you shift that narrative? How do you get a majority of people to view themselves, not just as American citizens, but um, global citizens and citizens invested in international systems, such as the UN and the International Court of Justice, and then from there, how do you galvanize American support in the long term? So I know there's a lot of comments like after the gas prices went up, like they were like, I can do it for a week. And then I don't know what the Biden administration is doing, but we need to step back. But how do you galvanize that support in the long term as well? Yeah, well, these are very, very good questions. And, you know, I'm glad that I have two practitioners here who are trying to make that happen. Um, I, I, I think. Honestly, I think it's a long-term kind of um, battle, uh, not battle, but educational process. Uh, I think that, you know, if you look at um, what kids are taught in grade school and then in high school, um, you know, there's not a lot about foreign affairs and why it's important and why, um, why alliances are important to us. You know, we do this because it helps us, not because it helps others, right? Although we're glad that it does help others. And so trying to uh, explain that, you know, from a very early age appropriately, and then getting into more sophisticated um, arguments as one gets to university and postgrad and everything else, I think that's important. I mean, shorter term with uh, the war in Ukraine, um, you know, I think President Biden uh, tried to start making that argument uh, at, during his speech when he was in Warsaw several weeks ago. Um, talking about how there might be some sacrifice needed, how this was, you know, autocracies versus democracies, et cetera, et cetera. But it was once over very lightly. And I think that it's going to take, um, you know, if, you know, as the months pass, because unbelievably, we're only, you know, starting month three now, it feels like it's been forever. Um, and I think, you know, for people who are not, um, you know, immersed, it must feel even longer. I think, you know, it's going to take bipartisan leadership to keep that focus on and to explain it to the American people in a way that um, I don't want to say is understandable, but maybe that is acceptable, that this is this is why it's important and this is why we are doing what we're doing. But it's going to be hard. The, I, I guess the, the other thing just about the educational system is the importance of critical thinking so that people can make their own decisions when presented with, you know, the myriad facts that are out there and, and um, do it with discernment and good judgment. I mean, I think we can answer one more question before Ambassador Yovanovitch has to go to Raleigh-Durham Airport. All righty, that's going to be a tough one. Um, I feel like since we only got one from online, I want to make sure that we get one more in. So I'm going to give it back to Samia here. Um, this has come up in a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned in the memoir challenges you faced on account of gender. Um, 
perhaps you can talk a little bit about um, how you've seen women best advocate for themselves um, in this career. Um, in the career of diplomacy? That's right. And, and as a professional in a male dominated field, mm -hmm. um, but also just that this is a career and a lifestyle. Yeah. Well, so I think this is a, you know, a question each person needs to answer for themselves. Um, but I think the first thing is um, being yourself. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, working in Embassy London as a very junior officer and how important that was to see that, you know, these three different men, totally different, could be successful being themselves. And the Brits, you know, who, you know, are different from us, they were completely accepting of those three different styles because they could see that this is who these people were they, and they were getting results. So the first thing is be yourself. Don't try to be um, somebody you're not. Um, because that will fall apart at some point <laughs> for sure. Um, and I think the second thing is, you know, and this is kind of an old fashioned way of looking at it, but if you're good at your work, uh, I'm not saying it always happens, but if you're, if you work hard and you produce results, um, you are going to do well in the foreign service and presumably any other career track because people respect results and they respect people who are experts in their field. And so I think that that is also um, something that is important. Um, you know, you can't succeed if you're not willing to put in the work and the time. Um, and I think the other thing is that, um, you know, if, if, un, if you're being treated unfairly uh, in the State Department, there are mechanisms for addressing that and you should take advantage of it. And so one of the things that I did, I wanted to work in the political area and I was um, not the right specialist for that, uh, for that area. And I took advantage of a class action lawsuit that somebody else had brought decades earlier, which the State Department fought at every turn for decades. Um, and uh, when uh, the court system imposed a remedy um, saying that the State Department had discriminated against women you know, in the exam that uh, we used for intake, in selecting people who came into the foreign service, in assignments and in promotions. I mean, that kind of covers the waterfront, right? <laughs> um, I raised my hand and I said, I'd like to be a part of that remedy. And I was fortunate enough to be able, um, I was included uh, in that. I think there were 14 women who got their choice of assignments in the, cone, uh, in the area of specialty that they wanted. And so that's how I got my assignment to the Moscow political section. But I didn't tell anybody about that until I wrote this book because I didn't want people to think uh, that I wasn't able to do the work, that I hadn't you know, earned that spot in the all-star section in, in, in Mo Embassy Moscow. Um, and even though over time, since I got that court remedy job uh, in Moscow, I had proven myself over and over again, but this goes back to imposter sy syndrome where you're thinking, ooh, but if I put that out there, people are gonna judge me differently. So I, I think it is important um, to seek out all the remedies and I think it's important to feel good about them too. I mean, our institutions don't always live up to our ideals and we need to make them do that. And on that note, please join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you.